Thanks, Ferran. Thank you guys all for coming. Um, today I'm going to talk about um, kind of an, uh, a lesser known um, aspect of, of, of districting and gerrymandering in the United States. Um, and it has to do only with um, legislative districting, so um, as opposed to congressional district or districting. So typically when somebody mentions redistricting, we think of the U.S. House of Representatives, but here I'm talking about um, legislative districting. So all of the 50 states um, basically mimic the federal government um, in terms of having the three branches. We have, they all elect, you know, single executives that are called governors, and then, then um, they all have state judiciaries. And then for the legislature, 49 of the 50 states have a bicameral state legislature, just like the U.S. federal government. Nebraska is the one outlier. They have a, a unicameral, nonpartisan um, legislation. Of course, it's not, not nonpartisan at all, right? You just, if you're a Republican, you don't say you're a Republican, but all of your symbols are red, right? And if you're a Democrat, all your symbols are blue, but you're just not allowed to say uh, what party you are. And of course, they all vote, they all vote together as well. So, um, uh, so, uh, and, and the reason why, well, I'll get to the reason why I'm talking about it, but there's a, there are differences in the way that the courts handle legislative districting compared to, to, um, to congressional districting, and I'll get to that uh, in the talk. So, but this is kind of what I think of as a feel-good story, right? This is kind of a, um, a problem, one particular aspect of partisan gerrymandering, and then the United States Supreme Court case in 2004 that makes a really important decision, um, and then how that has impacted uh, districting in the most recent round um, across the, uh, the 50 states. So, and, and it had a positive impact, uh, at least if you're, a, if you're kind of a one-person, one-vote um, proponent which I am. So, the, we refer to the redistricting revolution in the United States in the early 1960s. Um, prior to that, the, the, the federal courts refused to get involved in, in uh, redistricting cases, uh, despite the fact that there were lots and lots of problems with them, um, because they, they thought that this would be, these were political issues, right? This is, this is something that the legislature and the governors have to handle, um, and not uh, the courts. They didn't want to get involved. However, in the 1960s, um, it, uh, the, the particular uh, issue that got the court to wade into redistricting now, it's, they, they haven't turned back, um, was malapportionment. Um, so there was gigantic population differences within states across districts. Um, and so, and this, is, um, this makes sense um, in that, you know, from the late 1800s to the early 1900s, the U.S. went from a, a largely rural agricultural country to an industrialized uh, country with lots of urban centers. And so as these urban cities were growing, um, all the power was still in the rural areas and they would just not redistrict, right? They wouldn't give the state, the cities, um, the, the numbers of districts that they deserved, you know, based upon population. So the cities were basically underrepresented um, in term, and there, there, there was differences on the order of, of hundreds or even thousands, right? So you'd have a district in um, uh, Memphis, Tennessee, that had a thousand times more people than a district in rural Tennessee, um, and uh, this was so. This was the issue that got uh, the Supreme Court uh, to uh, to uh, uh, to start uh, adjudicating uh, different aspects of redistricting. So these are the four kind of landmark cases that were made kind of lickety split um, in the early 1960s that have to do with different aspects of one person, one vote. Um, but I'll just lump them all together. Um, and, uh, and, and call it a day. Um, but uh, basically, uh, the kind of key thing to know here um, about one person, one vote is that there were, did I mention this on the next slide? No, um, but the, the Supreme Court found different justifications for forcing states to draw districts that were equally populated, okay? So for congressional districts, um, they just looked at Article One, which is the, the, the first article, of the U.S. Supreme of the U.S. Constitution that covers the the Congress, right? Covers the the federal legislature, and so the, the U.S. House was supposed to represent the people, right? Quote unquote. And so the Supreme Court interpreted that as saying, well, districts should be equally populated, right? We're not trying to we're not trying to balance anything else. It's, you know, it's not land area, it's not trees, it's not money. Um, the people are supposed to be represented in the U.S. House, and so therefore districts within a state should have equal population so that you know one person's vote doesn't count more than another person's vote. Um, for legislative districts, um, 
uh, which uh, uh, was uh, the Reynolds case, um, the, the Supreme Court found the justification in the 14th Amendment, um, which was uh, the Equal Protection Clause, right? So the 14th Amendment is one of three constitutional amendments that was passed so shortly after the U.S. Civil War, um, and this was putting restrictions on the states, right, to make sure that, that nobody was treated unfairly, particularly, right, the freed slaves. Um, and so uh, the, the, the Equal Protection Clause guarantees that all the states, all 50 states must treat its citizens equally um, under the law. And so that was the justification, um, the constitutional justification for requiring equally populated districts for state legislative districts. Right? And the Equal Protection Clause, kind of importantly, doesn't mean perfectly equal, it means kind of equal, right? Um, that's kind of how the courts have, have interpreted it. So basically, there's kind of this bifurcation um, in one person, one vote standards. So for congressional districts, the courts have routinely regulated them to, to mean literally down to the single person, that each district really has to be uh, equally populated. But for state legislative districts, they haven't. And I'll cover more of that more in a, in a minute. So population deviations are really quite simple, right? Again, here we're just looking at one state. You don't take the whole nation together. Um, you, uh, it, in order to, to calculate a population deviation, you just take the total population of the state and the total number of districts that you're drawing it into and divide the former by the latter, right? So if you have 1,000 people living in a state drawn into five districts, the ideal population is 200 people per district. Um, so if you take, to calculate the total range, you take the difference between the largest district and the smallest district, in this particular example, 210 and 190, and then you can get um, uh, kind of a percentage deviation by taking the range that it's off by and divided by the, uh, the ideal population. So in this particular case, right, there's a 10% total deviation in this example. So as I said before, the standards um, that courts have used for legislative relative to congressional are different. Um, and, uh, and, 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 it, and courts, <coughs> Courts have, federal courts have interpreted, different parts of the country have interpreted these one person, one vote standards differently as, as they often do, right? I mean, the courts are supposed to kind of um, all decide things the same, but, they, but often, often they don't. So sometimes uh, deviations, even in for congressional districts, have been permitted over time. Um, although uh, more recently, they've become more and more strict about it, but they have to be justified, right? So this is the Karcher v. Daggett. And again, this is a case regarding congressional, not legislative districting. Um, and so these are the two questions that they're supposed to, that, that courts ask um, about uh, uh, in deciding whether or not to allow a deviation. So could the, could the differences have been reduced or eliminated with a good faith effort? The answer to this is almost always yes. It's not hard to eliminate um, uh, uh, um, these, these differences, and if uh, no good faith effort was made, can the state prove each variance was necessary to, to achieve some legitimate goal? So some states have come, have, have had small deviations in congressional and much larger in legislative by, by pr proposing some sort of legitimate goal, um, and often it has to do with preserving communities of interest, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, or these sorts of things, right? So. Um, so here's some of the legitimate goals. Trying to keep districts compact, that just means that the shape is rather nice, right? A square or something along those lines, not these kind of ugly uh, districts that oftentimes get drawn um, in the states. Respecting existing political boundaries, so county lines, municipal lines, natural boundaries, rivers, and this sort of thing. Um, preserving the core of prior districts is a perfectly legitimate goal, right? We don't want to change things too much because if we shift voters between districts, that's kind of disruptive for them. Um, and then avoiding pitting uh, um, incumbents against one another is a legitimate goal uh, as recognized by the courts. And this kind of makes um, some people uneasy, particularly in America, because we really like to, or this sort of, maybe you guys do too, but we have this sort of strange relationship with elected officials, right? We, uh, we, we get excited about them and elect them in and then sort of instantaneously uh, we're sick of them and we want to make sure they, you know, if they've ever done anything, right, the slightest um, uh, malfeasance in their past life, we want them to, uh, to get out of office. So, um, but courts don't like to, um, uh, to get rid of incumbents because they don't, don't, they don't see that as their position, right? So an incumbent is somebody that has been duly elected by, you know, tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands of people, and courts are kind of very 
um, wary to just kind of throw people out of office. Um, and courts oftentimes draw redistricting maps um, if a state is, um, is in a, a situation where they can't pass a new map, it, it's up to the courts to draw a map before the next election. So courts are very often involved in, in redistricting, not in a majority of the states, but in, in, in lots of them. Okay. So some of the recent cases, um, there was a, a federal case uh, for congressional districts from Pennsylvania, um, and this was a major uh, partisan gerrymandering case. It was called V. V. Jubilarer. Um, and there was a 19 person deviation. So this was from the 2000 round. I was actually an expert witness for the for Pennsylvania in this particular case. Um, and the districts at that time were about 650,000 people each. And so their largest district had 11 people more than the ideal population. And the one, um, the, the smallest district had eight people, right? So this is 11 people over, right, and eight people under. So a 19 person deviation from the ideal, which is 650,000 people, right? So this was, they thought, well, this is meaningless, right? Um, but they didn't have a justification. Um, for it at all, right? In fact, the guy testified in court, you know, why did you stop? Why didn't you get to perfectly equal population? And he said, you know, my boss told me to stop, so I stopped. Um, and so that, th that, those districts got thrown out um, by the federal court, um, and, uh, but it was actually very, it was a very quick fix for Pennsylvania. But that's kind of how far it's gone, is that, um, and th if they would, just would have been smarter about it, Pennsylvania could have got, could have got this through. They just needed to have a story to tell. Right, and so they just didn't have the they didn't have a story, so um, the court threw it out. But they just kind of fixed the districts really quickly, and and it wasn't that big of a deal. So for legislative districts, um, in uh, in the most recent past, the last thirty years or so, um, everybody that's involved in redistricting has assumed that there's a legal safe harbor um, of plus or minus five percent, so kind of a total ten percent range. Um, puts you in a legal safe harbor, which means you don't need any justification whatsoever. That if you come in with a legislative district plan that's plus or minus 5%, um, you don't, you're not going to need an explanation. The court is going to accept it. Well, that changed the court case. Um, that's kind of the crux of my story here, is a court case that came from Georgia um, and was heard by a three-judge federal panel um, in that circuit. Uh, that's called Cox v. Larios. And in this particular case, um, in Georgia, Georgia went crazy, um, and they, they, they've maximized the partisan nature of this 10% population deviation. Um, so basically what happens is the Democrats are in control, uh, they control the state legislature and the governor, so they, this is just like passing a, a state law. Um, they draw districts where every, every single Democratic-leaning district is basically 5% under the ideal population, and every Republican-leaning district is 5% over the population, right? So that's the kind of the simple tool that population deviations allow um, a gerrymander to work with, a gerrymanderer to work with. Um, and this got thrown out um, by, by a three-judge federal panel, and then it was appealed to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court summarily affirmed it, which, which means they didn't write a decision, but they sort of endorsed the decision of the lower court. And this was the first time a federal court has ever the Supreme Court particularly, has ever seen an actual partisan gerrymander that they declared this was wrong um, and this shouldn't happen. <clears throat> so, uh, as I said before, you know, this, uh, the reason why I think population deviations are bad is that it's a very simple thing to use to gerrymander the state. Um, again, you just you overpopulate the opponent's districts and you underpopulate your own districts, and this allows you to get a small, maybe an extra seat or two statewide, depending on how many seats, of course, are in the, the state legislature. And those vary widely among the states. I mean, uh, one of the smallest states is New Hampshire. Uh, they have uh, a state legislature that's the third largest legislature in the Western world by total number of seats, just behind. Uh, the British House of Commons and the U.S. House of Representatives. I can't remember how many it is, but it's, it's like the high 300s or something like that. Um, and so there, you know, each district, the people, the New Hampshire state legislators represent about 3,000 people each, so pretty small mm -hmm. districts. Um, so here's some of the arguments for allowing deviations. Um, the, the redistricting is based upon census data, so every 10 years. Uh, we take a, the federal government takes a census of the uh, of the whole country, and they, they try to count every single person. It doesn't matter if you're a citizen, if you're there legally, illegally. They try to count every single person in the country, and that those data become the basis 
for drawing both congressional districts and new state legislative districts um, shortly after the census is completed. Um, so obviously the census isn't correct, right? So, so making a state draw districts down to the, you know, a single person seems kind of silly. Right? I mean, because we know the census data were never right, and certainly, you know, a year later, the census data, even if they were right back then, they're no longer correct anymore. Um, and so, some people kind of have this kind of visceral reaction, like, "Well, that's kind of stupid. Um, you know, why would you, why would you equalize districts down to a single person based upon data that are faulty?" Um, uh, I think it's the the only way to do it because it's the only non-arbitrary number, right? I mean. Five, what's the difference between one percent, five percent? Right? We can pull in, you can pull any number out of thin air. Um, so I like equalized population, even though I know they're not really equal. But it's the best. The census data are the best estimate of the population. So let's use it, um, and uh, uh, realizing that there are faults. But but equalizing the population isn't is the only non-arbitrary number. Right? Five percent is arbitrary. Ten percent is arbitrary. Right? Um, so zero is not arbitrary, and it's not it's not particularly hard to do. Um, another uh, justification is that allowing population differences across districts allows you to keep communities of interest whole. Um, and this is a typical um, uh, uh, response to requiring strict um, one person, one vote um, uh, uh, standards. Now, communities of interest is, I mean, I have sort of a weird. Um, <laughs> I don't know if I have a relationship, but I suppose I have a relationship with communities of interest in my head. Um, but in my mind, community interest should be the most important thing, right, for redistricting, right? And this is kind of, um, and in the book I wrote a few years ago, uh, I argue that communities of interest uh, ought to be thought of as ideological, not geographic. But in America, we're stuck with geography, right, as the basis for community, communities of interest. So oftentimes it'll be counties, cities, um, other, you know, two cities that are connected by a bridge or something like that. But you can make up anything. Right, to be a community of interest. So if, every, if, if a, a good lawyer can make up any story for any section of the state to be community of interest, in my mind, there's no reason to even talk about communities of interest anymore. Uh, I was involved in Texas redistricting. This is back in 2002. Um, and the, uh, I was on the stand, and you know, one of the opposing map drawer lawyers was, was trying to testify through me to the, to the judge, as they often do. And you know, he's saying, well, look at our map, you know, Professor Burnell. What we tried to do here you know, in, uh, in eastern Texas is draw districts um, the way they looked in the 1950s. Right? And I was like, you know, uh, well, why, would, you know why, on the head, why on earth would you want to draw districts like they were 50 years ago? Right? What's, the, you know, what's the basis of that? And he sort of, he's like, oh, you know, we're kind of preserving communities of interest. And right, that was the first thing that came to his mind, communities of interest one. I was like, well, you know, I'm not buying it. You know, I mean, maybe the judge is buying this tale, but I just, I think that's stupid. I don't, I would never draw districts uh, the way they were 50 years ago. So, that's the kind of that for me is the problem with communities of interest is it's so slippery. Um, but if, if you ask, you know, people that are involved in city and county government, they'll always come testify. Oh, you got to keep this whole. We got to, you know, they want to be a majority in a single district. I totally understand that, but I just don't see cities and counties as communities of interest. I think for me, cities and counties are, are arbitrary, um, you know, designations that are designed to deliver public services to some population. Okay, so uh, you know, if you draw right, and you got to, you know, uh, the boundaries are arbitrary, right? I mean, the, the, they weren't, you know. And I always tell that to my students when you fly over Texas, you don't see, you don't see, you know, that you don't actually see this as you fly over Texas, right? They're all very proud. Uh, of the, sh the shape of the state and the size of the state, but, but somebody just made that up, right? Texas used to look far different, right? We used to control big portions of Oklahoma way up here. And Texas was even bigger than it is today. Um, so equal, for me, equalizing the, power of the, the voting power of individuals is far more important than worrying about pre-existing arbitrary boundaries. And again, deviations are used for partisan purposes. So that, for me, is the reason why one person, one vote should be kind of a strictly enforced for both congressional, as it is now, but also for state legislative. Right? And again, this is how I, uh, these are the counties. Uh, Texas has the most counties of any US state, 254, by far the most. The next one is Georgia. They have about 180 or something. And so some of these, you know, some of these are very, very small. Um, and you can see, right, so people always argue, oh, well, counties are communities of interest. I mean, look how bored they got, right? It's just like, it's like graph paper, <laughs> right? It's like, oh, if we're really going to draw this many, let's just get on with it, right? Let's start, you know, let's just draw grids. And I think they're small, you know, there are justifications 
you know, they were drawn quite a long time ago. And I think it, the idea was, you know, any part of the county, you know, you're within a one day horse ride of the county seat, right? So there are kind of these justifications like that. But still, for me, this is like, okay, we just, you know, overlaid a graph paper on Texas, and now all of these are, you know, communities of interest that have to be protected. And boy, if you split them up, God, that's going to be really bad for the people. So um, that's, again, for me, these aren't, these aren't important distinctions. Okay, so for this particular paper, we have kind of, a, you know, we have a, you know, a, Two, the last two rounds of redistricting in 2002 and 2012. And remember the Cox v. Larios decision happens right in the middle of them in 2004. So we should see some difference, right? We should A, be able to observe uh, a partisan uh, nature, partisan uses of um, population deviations in, in the various states um, in 2002. And I'm not saying they're gonna disappear by 2012 because they don't. Um, uh, but they should go down, right? We should see less of this. So I gathered data on the population for every district in every state, and this is just for the lower chambers. I only did uh, 50 chambers rather than, than all 99 of them. Um, uh, but the same should hold for, for the upper chambers as well. I just didn't bother to gather the data. Um, and I also, uh, of course, uh, I gathered information on which party won the election in following the redistricting, and that's how I code partisanship. Right? So I'm gonna be talking about Democratic districts versus Republican districts. So those are coded by which party won the election after, um, directly after the redistricting. Now, redistricting, generally speaking, is, a partisan, is done in a partisan manner in, in the, the states, although some states use nonpartisan commissions, um, like, um, California and Arizona are two major examples. Um, and so I coded for um, whether a state, whether the redistricting process was controlled completely by the Democrats, which means the Democrats controlled the governorship in both chambers of the state legislature, or the Republicans, the Republicans had unified control of the state government, or something else, right? And that could be a court drew the map because the state couldn't. couldn't. Uh, the state was divided. You know, maybe the, maybe a Democrat was governor and the Republicans controlled the state legislature, or they had a commission. Okay, so there's the, the unified partisan um, or something else. So the first hypothesis is that partisan districting is going to lead to systematic population deviations based on on party. Um, so if the Democrats are in control, we should see Democrat districts that Democrats win be underpopulated, and districts that Republicans win on average be overpopulated. And then hypothesis two is that the Larios decision in 2004 will have the effect of reducing deviations overall uh, and the partisan nature of these deviations as well. Okay? And, and there was a lot of uncertainty right, um, in 2012. Um, so I worked in, in, in lots of different states and, and most states were pretty, um, I mean this got to be a big thing. Um, so for instance, in Alabama, um, they went from a, a plus or minus 5% total population deviation to plus or minus 1%, and the Democrats sued in federal court and said this is a violation of the Voting Rights Act because this made it so that um, they were able to draw fewer majority minority districts that favored African Americans um, because uh, minority, majority minority districts typically end up being underpopulated. Um, but the court, the court threw, that, threw that out. Um, through that, didn't buy that particular argument. So, but it did, but some states were very cautious, right? You don't want to use plus or minus five um, and then have a court throw out your whole map because it's a, you know, this is a huge log roll, right? By drawing a map, I mean, so many people uh, have to be on board with this thing. If it gets thrown out, it's pretty, it's pretty um, devastating. Um, and you don't know what's gonna happen, right? Is the court gonna send it back to the state, right? Or is the court gonna draw its own map, which happens sometimes? So there's lots of uncertainty. Um, about what would happen if, this, if, if a court throws out your map. So states don't like it, right? They want to avoid that at virtually all costs. Okay, so I'll explain what the heck is going on here. So this is 2002 data, and sorry, the, the data are, um, are uh, going off the chart here. Um, so what do we have here? Um, so these are the 47 states in my sample from 2002. So the ones that are, that are colored blue are states in which the Democrats control the process. 
red ones are naturally are the Republican states, and then these uh, beige or whatever color you want to call that um, are states that are other, right? Either a court drew the map, or a commission drew the map, or the state had a divided government. So we're kind of not interested at some level. I mean, it's interesting to compare them, and there's some interesting results in 2012 with them, um, but kind of, I'm really interested in kind of the blue versus the red. And so what the heck do the bars mean? If a bar is, takes on a negative value, um, that means that Democratic districts are underpopulated relative to Republican districts, right? So imagine, so this is Georgia, right? This is the state that, this is, this is the redistricting plan right here that, uh, you know, sort of promulgated the, the Cox v. Larios case. So what happened, and it's, you know, it's like minus, almost minus 5%. So like I said, Democratic districts would be underpopulated. So I take all the Democratic districts take the average population, then take all the districts that Republicans won, take their average population, and then take the difference. It's as simple as that. So it's just, this is just a difference between Democratic average population and Republican, right? And so since this is negative, that means um, it was Democrat minus Republican. Is that right? Well, it doesn't matter. Negative numbers are Democratic advantages, and if they're positive numbers, the Republican advantages. In these states, basically, there's really no difference between Democrat and Republican states. And that can happen in a number of ways. In Illinois, for instance, in this particular case, they drew districts that were equally populated. Okay? So if, if all districts are equally populated, then regardless of the partisan distribution, right, the averages are going to be the same. But you could also get there by, you know, you could still use population deviations. And if you have a non, if, the, if there's no partisan component to it, you could still average the two numbers out. I hope I'm I'm making sense in my head, but I'm not sure if I'm communicating that properly. So, um, you know, kind of the biggest offenders here are Georgia, <laughs> and then Maryland is the second one, and then this is Mississippi right here. Uh, and then Kentucky, here's New York, Alabama, Alaska. Um, so you can see all of these, you know, the Democrats did very, very well in, in you know, uh, uh, seven states there, right? And then North Carolina, too, is pretty good. Um, but sort of, you know, you can see the biggest the biggest Democratic advantages are, are drawn by Democrats, not a big surprise, right? Wyoming, I'm not sure what they did. My own home state of Texas, I'm not sure what the Republicans were drinking in 2002, but they controlled the whole state, and yet they didn't take advantage of it. I'm not sure why. And I tried to find that out. I tried to find, you know, what, you know, what happened here? Um, and I, I haven't been able to get to the bottom of it. <coughs> so a kind of an important distinction here is that you can see a lot more blue than red. That's because in 2002, the Democrats controlled more states than the Republicans did. Um, and that's going to be in, in contrast to what you see in 2012, where there's far more, far more red. Um, and then, but you can see the, the Republicans don't do very well, right? There's only a couple, you know, two states uh, where it's sort of over, you know, remember down here, this is like minus four. And the, the, the highest the Republicans reach is like plus 2%. That's only in one state. That's in Delaware. Right, and then Utah is like maybe plus one percent. So the Democrats kind of took advantage of this more often than Republicans did, right? And sometimes, but sometimes it was drawn by Republicans, right? That's the kind of the kind of weird thing. Um, but still, there's kind of a partisan. There's definitely you can you can see a kind of a partisan uh, nature of what's going on here. Um, and then sometimes, you know, even courts or divided governments oftentimes can draw um, plans that are imbalanced in terms of uh, deviations as well. And it can happen naturally, too. I don't want to say that it's always partisan. Um, like I said, if you're trying to draw majority minority districts um, uh, in the South particularly, uh, oftentimes uh, uh, you're only able to do it if, um, if you draw a district that's underpopulated relative to other ones, particularly if you're trying to keep the same number of majority minority districts. All right, so this just breaks up the previous thing into the three different groups. Right, so these are the states with the Democratic control. You can see they kind of, they kind of did a good job. There's a couple states that had equal population. And there's only a couple states that kind of did the wrong thing, right? Or did, didn't do what you would expect them to do. Here's the Republicans again. You know, Wyoming and Texas, Michigan and Ohio. I'm not quite sure what was, what was going on there, but they drew districts that um, were Republican seats were on average larger in terms of population than the Democratic ones. And then here is the the new, what I call neutral control, uh, which again could be commissions, nonpartisan commissions like they do here in, in Australia. Um, they don't quite work as well in America. Um, divided government and courts 
And courts oftentimes will draw maps that courts often, courts are very cautious. And so a lot, a lot of times they'll draw what they call a least change map uh, in the states. They're like, we don't want to monkey around. Like I said, they don't want to throw incumbents out. You know, they, they have to worry about their legitimacy, so they draw what they call a least change map, and they just try to do as little as possible to try to, to, try to uh, change things for, the, for how the population changed over the previous 10 years. Okay, so these are just um, examples of um, um, different states. This is, again, we're still in 2002. So here's Georgia. This was the, the biggest offender, and the, these are just um, percent deviation, um, and these are the figures are called kernel density estimates, which is a really fancy name for a smooth histogram. So this is just a histogram, um, basically. And so you can see here's, you know, on the uh, x-axis here, um, the, um, the percent deviation. Uh, here's zero. Um, so these are Democratic districts, and, you know, they're all basically over here, which means they're all underpopulated by up to 5%. And then here's all the districts the Republicans won, and they're all overpopulated. Here's the other example. This was Utah. This was kind of the best example of a Republican partisan gerrymander. Similar, just kind of flipped a little bit. And then I hate, uh, here's Iowa. This was my example of kind of a, a good state. Uh, and Iowa gets um, mentioned a lot in redistricting. And usually I don't like to talk about Iowa um, because everybody thinks Iowa does everything right because um, they have, they have a, kind of a nonpartisan system. Um, uh, where supposedly they always draw fair maps and all this nonsense. And, oh, God, well, everybody should do like Iowa. And I think, I think it's a bunch of nonsense. However, in this particular case, right, Iowa was, was the best example, so I had to give them some props um, in the way they drew the state legislative. You can see they, they basically kept all of it between plus or minus 1%. And then also there's really no, you know, the Republicans are a little bit um, advantaged uh, relative to the Democrats. Um, but, you know, basically the, the, the kind of overlapping um, distributions. So here's 2012. And the figures are the same as they were last time, right? So this one, I can't, what state is this? Oh, this is Arizona. Um, so the first thing to notice is how little blue there is, right? And that's because in 2010, um, which is kind of the, the for redistricting people, the most important election are those that end in zero because that's going to, going to decide what constitutes the state government that's going to draw the next map, right? So you always draw between years that end in zero and years that end in two. So in 2010, the Democrats had a very bad year. The Republicans kind of cleaned up and took control of lots and lots of state governments. And so there's far more, they had by far way more control, way more states in America for a district than they ever had in the past. Um, and this is one of the reasons why the Republicans did so well in this last particular round. So the next thing to notice is that um, you know, the Republicans still haven't quite caught on, um, but North Carolina moved from a state that was controlled by Democrats, and they were way over here, if you remember, with the big Democratic deviation. The Republicans finally, finally, from their perspective, took over the state, um, and North Carolina was probably among the most partisan um, plans in the nation, both for the legislature and for Congress. Um, and they did very, the Republicans did, did very, very well. Um, the Democrats still kind of have an overall advantage. There's kind of far more states in which districts are drawn where Democratic districts are underpopulated relative to Republican districts. Um, but kind of interestingly, right, the, the, the top two here are both, um, where's California? In the middle. Oh, there it is right there, sorry. Um, so Arizona is, um, Arizona is the biggest uh, Democratic uh, deviation, and it was a nonpartisan commission state, and, um, and so this for me um, is kind of an example of, you know, why nonpartisan commissions don't always work, right? Because they too can. Uh, I can't remember what happened in Idaho, New York, and New York. I think it was it was divided control. Idaho, I'm going to guess, was done by by a court, because I don't think they have a commission, and I think they have a unified Republican um, state government. So. Um, there's still a couple, you know, Alaska and Michigan are still kind of, Alaska, Alaska has to draw majority minority districts for um, Native American Eskimos, and so that's predominantly why this happens, because they're, they're kind of, the Voting Rights Act kind of um, limits you in the number of districts you can draw, and there's, by, by that I mean there's a, there's a floor 
rather than a, there's a ceiling too based upon how many people there are, but there's also a floor which means you have to keep the same number of, of majority minority districts that you had in the previous map. And so American Eskimos as a proportion of the of the state aren't growing, they're, they're getting smaller because they're reproducing uh, at a lower rate than white people and there's no there's no new immigrants that are that are American Eskimos. Um, and so, but Alaska still has to keep around the same number of districts that favor um, uh, American uh, Eskimos. So they typically underpopulate those particular districts. Texas kind of caught on here. Texas drew a very good Republican map if you're a Republican, a very bad, bad map if you're a Democrat. Uh, but but uh, they, they obviously didn't maximize things. But but the overall the total po the total population deviations have gone down, and you don't you don't see the same partisan nature, right? You see you see a little bit of it uh, here and there, um, but you don't see the same kind of uh, more red over there. And you, certainly on the Democratic side, you don't quite see the same distribution um, of of uh, use of this particular tool. Um, so here's some simple statistics. Um, 24 states in the sample in 2002 used a plus or minus 5 total population range, and only 11 states kept the same range in 2012. Um, 21 states had statistically significant differences by party in 2002, so take whatever, Florida, take all the Democratic districts, all the Republican districts, do a simple t-test, a comparison to means test, you know, are, is there a statistically significant difference between these two populations for the mean? Um, so there was uh, uh, 21 in 2002 and only 13 in 2012. So the overall range in the partisan use of the deviations was affected by the Cox v. Larios uh, decision. Um, and the, over, over, the averages overall were also down, right? So the total population deviations went down and the partisan nature went down, which I'm going to show you here in a second. And then this last one is wrong because I had California here, but that was actually... Um, Iowa, but I, but in the I'm 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 not a fan of commission. So in the paper that I've written, I've kind of I I, I ding um, I try to sneak in, you know, something that says oh nonpartisan commissions are really bad, um, but the, the the reviewers didn't like that, so they made me change it. So Idaho wasn't it? What? It was Idaho, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, it was Idaho. Yeah. yeah. So, but I'll try to sneak it back in when it if, it, if and when it gets accepted. <laughs> Um, so this is just to show that overall um, the, uh, um, the use of population deviations, partisan use of population deviations went down 2000 to 2001, I mean 10. So basically the, the dependent variable here are those bars okay, that you saw. And then the independent variable, the redistricting authority, uh, is just the different colors, right? So it's a trichotomous variable. It's negative one if it's Republican zero if it's a, a gray, uh, a sand colored bar, and then one if it's a Democrat, okay? Uh, so if there, if there are, if there is a partisan nature to this, it should be negative, right? Because I've coded it that way. <laughs> um, because Democratic advantages, remember, are negative numbers, right? And then I have the, Demo the, 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 the Republicans as negative, so that would mean this would take on a negative coefficient. The, the story, though, is that it's significant, this variable is significant in 2000, but it's not in 2010. So you don't see the same partisan use um, of, this, of this particular tool of the gerrymanderers. So, oh, whoops, darn it. All right, so my conclusion is that um, while well, population deviations weren't perfectly aligned with partisanship in either state, I think there's a much clearer um, use of it in 2002, and then we had this treatment, right, this intervention, which was the Larios decision by the Supreme Court, and that had, uh, in my mind, a beneficial impact on legislative redistricting by both reducing the deviations overall and also discouraging states from really using, you know, pushing the partisan nature of this, right? So this doesn't mean gerrymandering's gone, right? Quite the contrary, gerrymandering is alive and well. But this is just one, you know, one arrow in the quiver, right? That's kind of been taken away by the, by the courts in my mind. So 10% is an arbitrary level for allowable deviations. Like I said, I like zero, because um, it's, it's not arbitrary. Um, uh, equalizing population across states is not hard to do. It's quite easy to do. You might have to break up more cities and counties. You might have to make districts a little more uglier. Um, but, but for me, you know, I argue that that's, the mo that's important, right? For me, I want to have 
um, the same voting power as other people. And this might be, right, this might be my own partisan bias. I was born in California, then I lived in New York, and now I live in Texas. So I'm always in a big state, right? In big states, always we have less voting power than small states in America, particularly because the U.S. Senate, but also big states get, get, um, get the short end of the stick in lots of other ways. So again, this might be my own kind of big state biases, but for me, one person, one vote is, is critical. Um, and then again, this is just my, um, uh, my thing that this does not eliminate. I threw this in there because the, again, because the reviewers, the reviewers like, oh my gosh, it sounds like, you know, all gerrymandering was eliminated because of this. And so that's not what I mean to say. Um, you could still, you can, you can, you can draw equally populated districts that are incredibly well gerrymandered, right? So, but this just takes one tool out of the toolbox. And I, and I think that's a good thing and it had a positive impact. So that's it. Thank you.